Waking up in the morning. Making your morning coffee. Recognizing friendly faces. Eating, sleeping, breathing, loving. It's easy to forget that we owe all of this to one thing. Who you are depends entirely on what's happening in your brain. And we tend to think of ourselves as, well, there's me and I've got my personality and my sense of humor or whatever. And then there's my brain, which is this biological organ. But, but in fact, these are inseparable. Responsible for everything we'll ever think, know, or experience, our brains are completely shut off from the world we rely on them to navigate. Locked in the silence and darkness of our skulls, all our brain ever experiences of the outside world arrives in the form of electrochemical signals rocketing along neurons at up to 268 miles per hour. Somehow the brain is really good at extracting patterns and assigning meaning to these patterns of activity. And from that you get your entire subjective world. All the colors and the sounds and everything that's going on around you, it's actually happening in darkness in there. So how does it happen? How are firestorms of electrochemical signals responsible for everything any human has ever felt? ever thought or ever done? How do our brains piece together reality? The journey begins with gathering data from the outside world. Fundamentally, the brain is a, a general purpose computing device. And whatever information you feed it, it'll figure out the best that it can do with it. There are lots of ways to get input into the system. Each animal detects its own little version of what's going on. We have a word for this in science. We call this the Umwelt, which is the German word for the surrounding world. Different animals sense different parts of their environment. We happen to have eyes and ears and nose and fingertips and so on, but other animals have completely different machinery. If you're an echolocating bat, you fly around in the dark and you chirp and you get back these air compression waves and that's how you can construct a three-dimensional model of the world. If you're the star-nosed mole, you've got 22 appendages and you've, you feel with these fingers in the dark through these tunnels and that's how you can tell the three-dimensional structure of these tunnels. For each sensory organ, the mechanisms are similar. Take the human eye. Light bounces off an object and hits your retina, where there are two types of photoreceptor cells, called rods and cones. These cells translate light into the electrochemical signals that travel to your brain along the optic nerve. Tiny hairs in your inner ear do the same for sound waves, before sending them along your auditory nerves. It's up to our brains to give these cascades of signals meaning. Our brains piece together all of this information to help us navigate the world. But the human brain is not a simple computer, and every brain is different. Sometimes we get dramatically different results. The way that you see reality and that I see reality might be very different. And you know, when we talk about do we see red the same way, probably not. Nature provides many clues that our brains may not be perceiving the full scope of reality. Dogs, cats, and other animals have poor color vision compared to us humans. To them, our lush world appears mostly in shades of gray, with some blue and yellow mixed in. More extreme clues about the natural limits of our perception can be seen in creatures like mantis shrimp, whose eyes can detect ultraviolet light. The interesting part is that presumably every animal imagines that the umwelt is the entire world out there, just like we do with our vision and our hearing and so on. We think, oh, I'm seeing reality, but in fact, we're only seeing a small slice of it. The amount of light that we see that we call visible light is actually less than a 10 trillionth of the light spectrum. All the other stuff 
like gamma rays and x-rays and cosmic rays and cell phone conversations, all that stuff is passing right through your body because you don't have specialized receptors to pick up on that. But could our brains process more types of information if only we gave it the tools? While we're pretty attached to our familiar senses like touch and taste, our brains aren't nearly as picky. From the brain's point of view, all it knows is it's getting these spikes of, of information. It sounds strange, but if you think about the way a, a blind person passes a finger over Braille, it's just these little bumps and they can come to cry or laugh at the story that they're reading. It's the same thing. You're essentially just feeling these, this information on your skin and that gets to your brain. Neuroscientists like David Eagleman are using the brain's natural flexibility, called plasticity, to adapt our old senses in new ways, to expand our brain's access to the world. And our skin is a promising new frontier. Your skin is this incredible organ. It's the largest organ of your body. It covers your body. Um, but in modern life, we cover it up and we don't really use it for much of anything. In my lab, we've built this vest and it's covered with vibratory motors. It's just like the, the buzzing motor in your cell phone, except there are 32 of them. We can translate any kind of data stream into patterns of vibration all over your torso. Okay, uh, let's try four new words. One of our first subjects was a gentleman named Jonathan who um, was profoundly deaf and at the age of 37, he'd never heard anything in his life. So there was a part of his, you know, possible experiential world that was just missing for him. Work, work, play. So we put the vest on him. He was, he was our first subject and we trained him for a couple hours a day for four days and by the fifth day, he was able to get words. Sleep. Work. We would say a word and he would right. feel the pattern on the vest and he would write on the board what word he right. thought we said. The pattern is too fast. You've got 32 motors and, and it's on a 16 millisecond time frame. So you can't possibly get it consciously, but his brain was unlocking those patterns. Work. This is called sensory substitution. And hearing and seeing impaired humans have been inventing new forms of it for thousands of years. But with these new technologies, the goal is not only to make sensory substitution a faster, more unconscious ability, but to access a broader slice of reality. For example, we're expanding the sense of smell by having a molecular detector that picks up on sense, and you feel that. So you can tell sort of what a drug dog could feel with its long snout and its specialized sense reception. You can expand your sense by just turning that into information you have on your skin. There's really no limit on the horizon as far as how much we could expand our umwelt, whether that's stock market data or Twitter or weather data or prosthetics or smell data or whatever it is, the opportunity is now open for us to feed in new senses and have a bigger and bigger understanding of the reality around us. There probably will be some limit. The brain readjusts its real estate depending on what's coming in, but we're not up against that limit yet. We could probably have several more senses and the brain would be able to understand that just fine. But even just with our old fashioned senses, a lot of work goes into the relatively stable sense of reality that our brains create for us. It's hard to appreciate just how much our brains do for us because we're not even aware that most of it's happening. As it turns out, that's intentional. We wouldn't be able to function if we had to have access to what's going on in the unconscious brain. And that's because we are these enormous creatures made of trillions and trillions of cells. And somehow this little three pound organ has to control this whole thing that's happening. Most of what we do is unconscious. Everything from lifting a cup of water to your mouth, to recognizing a friend's face, to falling in love, to driving a car. All these things are underpinned by lightning storms of brain activity, but you don't have any awareness to this or any access to this. Instead, it just seems natural to you. 
Something like vision takes up about a third of the human brain, but it just feels natural. You open your eyes and there's the visual world. When you think about the unconscious brain, you think about heartbeat and, and digestion and uh, breathing and so on, but it's all this other stuff too. Keeping all of the trains on track requires some masterful orchestration by our brains. Just to ensure we experience time and space as solid, stable, and reliable, our brains actually have to create a series of illusions. What we think is that we move through the world and you see something and you immediately perceive it. But in fact, your brain has to gather that information and put it together. And the weird part is that your different senses have different timelines for how quickly they process things. So for example, vision is slower than hearing, which is why you use a gun at the Olympics to start the sprinters. If I touch your face, that gets registered by your brain almost immediately. But if I touch your toe, it takes a long time for that signal to climb all the way up your spinal cord and get to your brain. Some hundreds of milliseconds slower. And yet, if I touch your toe and your nose simultaneously, you'll think that those are simultaneous. The brain waits for all the sensory information to come in, stitches it all together, and then you have this feeling that the moment now just occurred. By the time you feel that, it's already happened a long time ago. We might not notice our brain shaping our perception of time on a daily basis, but under extraordinary circumstances, it becomes more obvious. That's what happens when time seems to slow down, or even stand still. What happens is when you're in a very scary situation, you've got these parts of your brain that come online that are emergency centers for when everything's hitting the fan. And you write down memory with these systems, essentially on a secondary memory track, much denser. You retain everything that's going on. And your brain's only interpretation of that is, oh, it must have lasted longer because I remember the hood crumpling and the rear view mirror falling off and the look on the other guy's face. So you think, wow, that must have taken a really long time, but it's only in retrospect that, that you think that. It's a trick of memory. Under normal circumstances, your memory is like a sieve. You're not remembering most everything that's happening, and so you've got this way of judging how much time passed. On a longer time scale, this translates to what kind of new memories you're writing down. So what happens to all of us as we get older is we get into routines, and when you're in routine, your brain's not really writing down any memory. So you get to the end of a, a summer as an adult, and you think back about your work, and you think, I don't even have that much footage to draw from. I, I guess nothing really happened. It seems like that whole summer disappeared quickly. In contrast, when you're a child, everything is new. It's all novelty, and so when you look back on a summer's worth of memories, you have so much memory. And so it seems like it lasted longer. That tells us we need to always be seeking novelty because that's the thing that expands our lives. I can't tell you how to actually live longer, but I can tell you how to make it seem as though you've lived longer, which is by finding new things that actually write down memory. These tricks of memory aren't the only way our brains determine our reality. In fact, our brain's subjective understanding of the world isn't just limited to how we experience certain events. It's hardwired into our biology itself. The fact is your brain is changing all the time depending on your levels of testosterone and your stress at this moment and what's going on and what time you woke up and so on. Your brain is changing all the time. On a long time scale, we have this illusion of continuity, like I'm the same person I was a year ago and 10 years ago and so on, but none of that is true. And in fact, you're, you're changing quite a bit through time. We can see this most clearly when our skull, the quiet calcium shell that protects our brain, is shattered. Humans can transplant organs and engineer artificial limbs without fundamentally changing who we are. But our brains are different. The brain is one thing, if you damage even a little bit of it, you're completely changed. The way we know that is because of all the examples of damage we see to the brain. Even if you damage your brain just a little bit, that changes who you are entirely. Just as an example, Phineas Gage was a young railroad worker, and there was an explosion that caused a iron rod to pass through his head, and his personality changed entirely after that happened. It became a famous medical case because he didn't die. But he became a very different person, and I think 
That was one of the first examples in the medical literature that told us, wow, what's happening with your biology matters about how you behave. Because of this deep connection between our brains and who we are, a better understanding of our brains won't only advance medical science, it could help us build a more sophisticated society. Brains all develop in very different ways, depending on genetics and, and all of life experience. Brains go off on very different trajectories. In reality, no two bodies are identical, and no two lives are identical. So no two brains are identical. Even given the same exact information, no two brains will process it the same exact way. This is what we value about computers, is it keeps data exactly the right way. But brains are sloppier and stranger than that. They manipulate data in, in ways and try out new versions. And that is the basis of the whole creativity of our species. But this engine of creativity also makes it more difficult for humans to genuinely empathize with one another. It's very hard, actually, to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Yeah, you know, we all try to do that all the time, but we stink at it. When we step in someone else's shoes, we're essentially taking all of our life experience and stepping there and saying, well, I wouldn't have done that or whatever. These stubborn assumptions don't only have consequences for our personal relationships. They also lie at the heart of the United States' troubled, one-size-fits-all criminal justice system. America has the number one incarceration rate in the whole world. We put a higher percentage of our population behind bars than any other country in the world. It's very expensive and it has very low utility. What if we could use neuroscience to design a more effective, more humane system? I'll tell you where this is already taking place. When counties run out of money, when they want to build another prison and they can't afford it, they start doing things that are a little bit smarter. They have a specialized drug court where the judges and juries have expertise in drug rehabilitation. And you send people down that route and you can get something done there. Specialized mental health court. So you send somebody there, judges and juries have expertise in what mental illness is and what are the rehabilitative strategies. There are different ways to route people through the system depending on what's going on with their individual brain. As our understanding of our brains and their plasticity evolves, the possibilities reach far beyond our justice system. From education, to healthcare, to technology, how well we understand our brain's world could revolutionize our ability to shape our collective outer world. The general story with the brain is it's very hard to look at it because it's locked in this bony vault that Mother Nature provided to protect it. And so what we have are techniques to peer inside the brain non-invasively in a living brain. But these techniques aren't that great. We're kind of missing the sweet spot. We can look at millions of neurons at once, or using an electrode, we can measure just a few neurons. But what we really need is to be able to measure what's happening with tens of thousands of individual neurons at once. And when we can get down to that kind of scale, then we can really make progress on understanding what are the computations that the brain is doing. It is a really exciting time in neuroscience, but I think the best is yet to come. <laughs>